Good morning, beloved. One evening, a man decided to show his wife just how much he loved her. After dinner, he began to recite to her romantic poetry, telling her that he would climb the highest mountain just to be near her. He would swim the widest ocean. He would cross deserts in the burning heat of the day and even sit at her window and sing love songs to her in the moonlight. And after listening to him go on for some time about his immense love that he had for her, she ended the conversation when she asked, yeah, but will you wash the dishes for me? <laughs> sort of reminds me of our, our text for today, at least how it starts out which is 1 Corinthians chapter 13, if you want to join me there. We usually think of it as the great love chapter of the New Testament. It's certainly a great chapter on love. And so we often hear it read on occasions like weddings and uh, anniversaries and things like that. You remember how it begins? Uh, it's about all these great things that uh, one might do sort of like the guy in the story that we began with. You know, climb mountains, swim oceans, cross deserts, all to prove his love. But in 1 Corinthians 13, it's not about a husband trying to impress his wife, but about a person apparently trying to impress his God or perhaps his fellow believers. So remember how it goes? begins... If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Speaking in tongues, impressive. Prophesying, pretty impressive. Understanding mysteries, having great knowledge, having great faith, impressive. Being extremely generous, impressive. Offering one's own life, very impressive. But each time the refrain comes back, does it not? Without love... It is meaningless. It is nothing. So for good reason, this is called the great love chapter of the New Testament. I wonder, though, how often we have really read and studied this chapter closely in context in its true setting in 1 Corinthians. We might uh, learn something new from it, seeing it from a different angle, perhaps a more biblical one, if we're careful with the context, rather than just, you know, pull it out whenever we want a reading or a lesson on love. Because the fact is that the 1 Corinthians 13 comes between 1 Corinthians 12 and 1 Corinthians 14. Now there's an insight that you have uh, been waiting for all week. Aren't you lucky to have me as your preacher be able to point that out? Um, but it's true. And there is some significance to that, actually. If you think about it for a minute, these three chapters of God's Word, they really do go together. Paul is doing something important in these three chapters. He is addressing the church... And particularly, he is addressing life in the church. So for, uh, 
For the last two weeks, we looked at how Paul compared the church to a body in 1 Corinthians 12, and we talked about the fact that it truly is biblical to consider yourself a member of the church, a member of the body of Christ, and we talked about, especially last Lord's Day, that a big part of what, what it means to be a member of the church is to be a functioning part of the body, a working member. And so when we come to chapter 13, this love chapter, it truly has a, a meaningful context. Uh, this love stuff is, is, is in a church context, a uh, church membership context. And then as we move on from chapter 13 into chapter 14, we'll see that the apostle continues to talk about church life and address that, especially at Corinth. And they were having some problems that he's dealing with in the church there, and it's surrounding the issue in chapter 14 of spiritual gifts and what's going on as they come together to worship. So... To me, it's important that we read this very familiar chapter in light of its context. And I'd like us to read the rest of it this morning. Um, we read the first three verses, but let's pick up at verse 4 and read the balance of the chapter down through verse 13. So he goes on and he says, Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put away childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now, faith, hope, and love abide. These three, but the greatest of these is love. I want to bring before you today... The idea that the biblical foundation of church membership is the topic of this chapter, love. So love is the foundation of church membership. Love is what creates a church. The love of God in Christ Jesus creates a church. Love is also what sustains a church. Jesus expected his disciples to have great enduring love for one another. And so he said to them, By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. So when we talk about the identifying mark of the church, we had better start with this. And then Paul reminds us that love is what builds a church. Ephesians chapter 4, for example, he wrote, Speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. And so, in keeping with the way that Paul began 1 Corinthians 13, think about it. 
we can do all kinds of amazing things in a church. We can build an impressive building. We can build a bunch of buildings. We can have a campus. We can even do what's really popular seemingly today, and that is to have satellite campuses where we send in live feeds of the service each week. We can do all kinds of impressive things in the church, but if we have not love, it is nothing. We can send missionaries all over the world. We can send them to the farthest reaches of the planet. And if love is missing, it's all for naught. We can stand for truth, tall and strong. But if we don't love, it's nothing. So I hope you see how it works. Love is the foundation. And when I speak of this and sort of extol love this morning, I am not suggesting some fuzzy, nebulous concept. I'm not talking about something that's sentimental. I'm not talking about an emotion or a feeling. In fact, I'm trying to get away from that as much as I possibly can with you. Because Paul doesn't do that here in 1 Corinthians 13. If you read it, isn't Paul very clear what he's talking about? Isn't he specific? He tells us what this love is that he's speaking of, and he he goes on and on in detail. He says, for instance, it's patient. He says it's kind. He says it rejoices with the truth. He says it bears all things, and it believes, and it hopes, and it endures, and It is not envious, this love that he's speaking of. And it's not boastful. And it's not arrogant. And it's not rude. And it's not irritable. It's not resentful. And it doesn't insist on its own way. I challenge you today to really look at that long list of love's definition, put it in the context of church membership, and see if you can think of any problem in the church, any problem, that would even exist if biblical love were being practiced in the way defined by Paul here. By inspiration. I seriously doubt that you'll be able to come up with any problem that would still exist if God's people love like they've been called to love. Church problems come down ultimately to love problems. Either our love for God is deficient or our love for one another is lacking. If we could perfectly abide by the principles laid down here in the love chapter, we would have perfectly healthy churches. Now, we all realize, we know ourselves, we realize we're fallen and that we're sinful people We are by definition not perfect yet, and so churches are not perfect, and we shouldn't expect them to be. A lot of people looking for excuses not to be in church seem to expect churches to be perfect, but they're not because they're filled with people like us. Church at Corinth. I mean, think about it. First century, so close to the time of of the gospel events, 
church at Corinth was not perfect. Not by a long shot. Just read the letter. Uh, you don't even have to read the whole thing. Just read the first six chapters of the letter to, to Corinth and you will see that it wasn't perfect. In fact, it will shock you what the Apostle Paul was dealing with among these brethren in Corinth. But the, the truth is they didn't have a single problem that could not be fixed with a healthy dose of biblical love. And again, not an infusion of emotion and sentiment. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about real biblical love. They had, and we have, no problem that cannot be fixed by more patience and kindness, more tr joy in the truth, more willingness to bear up and, and to believe and to hope and to endure. There's no problem, can't be fixed that, or healed by, by less envy and less boasting and less arrogance and less rudeness and less insisting on my way or the highway and less irritability and less resentment. No problem that can't be fixed by biblical love. I wish I could make a law. And I realize I can't. I'm not the, the king. I'm not the head of the church. But perhaps you'll, uh, you'll appreciate what I mean by this. I wish I could make a law for a period of time that we would stop using the word love amongst one another for a period of time. You think, well, that's a strange thing for a preacher to say. But we just wouldn't use it. But, but every time we thought it applied, we do something. We do something that showed love or demonstrated great love. Because you see, love is not primarily a word or even a concept. Love is action. Love is behavior. It's how Christians treat one another when they're being like Jesus. Love is something lived out among believers. It's something we do, you see. And so whenever we, we think love or want to say I love you, it ought to be concrete action. And it ought to be accompanied by something that is done. In other words, if I love you, I am patient with you. And, you know, Sometimes that is hard work. It's hard for me to be patient with you people. And I know it's hard for you to be patient with me. But if I love you, I will be. And if I love you, I'm kind to you. Even if you haven't been kind to me, you see. Remember Jesus? In the midst of all the abuse, physical and verbal, that was being heaped upon him, 
what he was doing in return? And if I love you, I'm going to let you have your way sometimes, even though I know I'm always right. As long as we're not sacrificing the truth of God, I'm going to let you have your way probably often. Because, you know, in love, we're going to be patient with one another and, and we're not going to be sacrificing truth. We're going to be rejoicing in the truth. And, and if I love you, I'm, I'm not going to be boasting around you. I'm not going to be arrogant to you. And if I love you, I am, I'm absolutely going to go out of my way not to be rude to you. And I am not, if I love you, I am not going to live my life resenting you if you've offended me. Not if I love you. And if I love you, I'm going to do my best not to be irritable with you. And that's hard for me because I'm a grumpy old man. That's hard work for me. But if I love you, I'm not going to be irritable with you. And I'm going to bear with you, and I'm going to believe in you. And I'm going to hope for you, and I'm going to endure with you if I really love you. Why? Because love is so much more than a word. Love is action. Love is the foundation of biblical church membership. So folks, let's love one another in both word and deed until the one who loved us above all returns. I'll leave you with one verse. 1 John chapter 3, verse 18. Little children, the apostle of love wrote, Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. So may it be among us, as members of this church body, may that be what we're about at our foundation. This morning, we offer the invitation of the one who loved us above all, Jesus the Christ. If any need to come before this body, asking for prayers, support, help, if anybody needs to come before this assembly and give their life to the Lord and obey his gospel today, uh, we take time at the close of our service to offer that opportunity. That opportunity is available 24-7, 365, of course, but it's available now. Now's the moment we have. If you need to come, won't you let us know what your need is while we sing and try to encourage you. Let us stand, please. Days are filled with sorrow.